Hello, my name is Kim Eagle. Uh, we're here for ACC.org talking about highlights of day two of our in-person ACC 22 meeting. And I'm joined today by Pyle Coley from Denver and Deepak Bhatt from Boston. So many trials being presented at this meeting, it's hard to pick the ones that we want to cover. But today we found four that we thought would be uh, very interesting for you to hear about. And we'll start with a great name, Hackman. Deepak. Well, these are great trials, and I think we picked them primarily because they've got the best acronyms. So we're starting off with Pac-Man, but the other ones have great acronyms, as uh, you and the audience will soon hear. Uh, and, and I love this trial. I actually used to love playing Pac-Man. I used to be quite good at it back uh, when there were arcades and people would go to arcades and play video games. But at any rate, it, the concept is similar. I hear it's a matter of taking folks after an MI, STEMI and STEMI, randomizing them. Uh, to alirocumab or not, uh, on top of a good dose of a good statin, resuvastatin, and then looking at a bunch of imaging technologies, and NIRS, IVAS, OCT, and uh, seeing what happens to the plaque. And uh, really, quite remarkably, uh, there was a very significant reduction in plaque, even just by you know, a year, about a, a percent less uh, atheroma volume in the patients that were randomized to the PCSK9 inhibitor. So to me, that shows the benefit of early initiation of PCSK9 inhibition. Uh, granted, these uh, weren't clinical events that we're talking about. This is imaging type events, but still, given the other data for PCSK9 inhibitors from Odyssey outcomes in ACS patients and, and Fourier and more stable patients and reductions in ischemic events in those trials, I think it really paints a nice picture and uh, putting economic issues aside, uh, certainly does support early initiation of PCSK9 inhibitors in appropriate high-risk patients. And the fibrous cap was changed too, was it not? Yeah, there were a bunch of different parameters that people that live in this space of imaging of plaque uh, would say are really important and really good predictors of future ischemic events quote unquote, vulnerable plaque, if I can use that phrase. So to me, the findings actually are important, albeit a modest size and mechanistic trial, given that there are large outcome trials, this provides some explanation of the benefits we're seeing in those trials and implies that the benefits seen there would be even potentially larger were we to start therapy in closer proximity to the ischemic event. The LDL reductions were impressive, right? Under 30 in the alarucumab group, compared to the Crestor group, the 20 milligrams, which was around 70. So we're and seeing also, huge, huge drops in LDL. Yeah, I'm and glad you mentioned. And they also correlate that with changes in plaque. And, you know, it does seem like lower is better with respect to plaque progression, even getting down below 50, you know, even in the 30 and below range, it seemed to keep uh, having an influence on, on plaque progression rates. So I, I think uh, the prevailing paradigm that has emerged, trying to get the LDL as low as you can, assuming there are no side effects, is the way to go. And here, you know, there were some injection site reactions and that sort of thing, as is known with this class of medicine, but not any really bad side effects. Pyle, any comments? You know, I would add that the story is coming together really nicely. Now we've seen this with the Huygens data with Evolucumab. Now we're seeing it with Pac-Man, with Alarocumab. And Deepak, I would add, we've also seen similar changes in plaque characteristics occur with Facepa or Icosapentethyl in the Evaporate study. So I think we're really seeing a nice story of how these outcomes may, you know, the explanation for why these outcomes are improved with some of these agents. And some of that may be LDL, but some of that may also be plaque composition, inflammation, so on and so forth. Yeah, agreed. So Deepak, you know, you're playing with your hands doing Pac-Man when you were young. Yeah. Probably predicted that you'd be an interventional cardiologist, you know? Well, you know, a lot of the same skill sets actually go into it, right? I mean, it's doing something from a distance. It's, it's surgery at a distance. Got it. Okay. No wonder I wasn't very good at that. <laughs> I, I'm sure you were pretty good. <laughs> we're going to go on now to another great name. It's called Superwin. And this is a really important study. Pyle, take it away. Yes, I think this study is indeed actually a super win, so it's appropriately named. And essentially what it looks at is a question that we often forget to ask ourselves. Nutritional interventions. You know, food is always and should always be the first best medicine for everybody. And often as physicians, we forget that. So I really commend the investigators for doing this type of a trial, because not only is it emphasizing the nutrition piece of it, but it's also doing it in a collaboration with the retailer, which may be something interesting for us to explore in the 
the future. So what they did is they took patients who had one or more cardiovascular risk factors, they shopped at Kroger and they randomized them to one of three groups. So one was the standard group where they you know, just got the standard education on nutrition. The second was a more intensive education where they met with a registered dietitian while they were shopping at Kroger who looked at their purchasing patterns and really gave them feedback based on their purchasing patterns. That was six sessions. And then the third was the purchasing pattern feedback in addition to some feedback on online shopping and what individuals did online shopping. And then they looked at something that they called the DASH score, which was essentially looking at their dietary intake and how it you know, modified over time. And different uh, components of it comprised of fruits and vegetable intake, and they calculated a score. And it was interesting to see that educational intervention did improve the DASH score based on purchasing data. Now, one of the challenges for this trial was that it occurred during the pandemic. And you can see very clearly from the data that the pre-pandemic compliance with the educational visits was much higher than the post-pandemic or during pandemic compliance. And I think that may have affected some of the results. Unfortunately, the interventional benefit didn't seem to sustain past six months, and it didn't really translate into health measures like blood pressure changes and such. But to me, again, the study was very well done, and it really does raise the philosophical question whether we ought to start taking some of our interventions outside the exam room and bring them to where the patients are, including the supermarket. We've also seen similar effects occur in barbershops and other social settings. Excellent summary. Deepak, any, any thoughts about this important trial? I think Paul summarized it really beautifully. You know, this was a challenging trial to do. COVID made it even harder. It would have been challenging anyway. I think the PI, Dr. Christine, you know, did a great job uh, persevering. And really, to me, the importance is, as Paul said, twofold. One is just the findings from the study, the primary endpoint was met. Uh, but beyond that, just this concept of taking healthcare into the grocery store, whether it's the a virtual grocery store or the physical grocery store. And I think it just shows that we can do a lot, a lot more in terms of health improvement of populations by going outside the clinic. It's not all a matter of care being centered just in the hospital anymore. And as we think about really integrated healthcare systems, vertically and horizontally integrated, maybe the grocery store should be part of that. Totally agree. This is like hand-to-hand -hand combat to uh, sort of undo some of societal ills that have led to poor health uh, in this country and other countries as well. Great study. Now, one of the jewels of this particular meeting is a, is a trial called DIAMOND. Deepak, tell us about that trial. All right, Kim, I saw what you did there. Very nice, very, very <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I think it is a, a jewel of the trial. I mean, it, really the findings are terrific. So just to bring the audience up to speed very quickly, we're talking about pterimer. It's a potassium binder. Uh, so the idea is in people are, that are hyperkalemic uh, to make them normal kalemic. And there's prior data that shows the drug does that. Here in Diamond, uh, there were patients who were essentially randomized to Pterma or placebo. Uh, the design is a little bit more complex than that, but it's fine to just think of it that way. And these were folks uh, that were initially uh, a bit hyperkalemic, K above five, uh, or normal kalemic, but had some sort of history of discontinuation of RAS inhibitors. And the idea was to either initiate or optimize a mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. As everybody knows, drugs like spironolactone, very efficacious in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but a lot of doctors are scared to use them because of hyperkalemia. And, and that is a known side effect. So at any rate, the patients who were randomized here uh, to the paternal continuation uh, did very well with respect to potassium levels, a significant benefit uh, compared with the control arm. And even if we look, I guess you could say at, at sort of harder endpoints, secondary endpoints like hyperkalemia, greater than 5.5, significant benefit uh, favoring pteromer, uh, looking at patients where there was a reduction of the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist dose below the target dose, significant benefit again in favor of uh, pteromer. And, and not just, you know, I mean, the hazard ratios were impressive, like around 0.6 or something for that particular endpoint, but the absolute risk reductions were respectable as well. Something like 19% um, um, uh, in the placebo arm versus about 14% in the pteromer arm. So, you know, this is a real meaningful benefit in my opinion. And uh, it, it, it's interesting that we're getting a point in refining our therapies where we're getting drugs, not just to treat the patient, but to treat the side effects from the first drug. So, um, you know, things are incrementally improving in medicine. And I think this is a really useful tool. 
it really uh, it really allows a larger percentage of our patients to be on guideline directed medical therapy because we we stop some of these agents so commonly because of either fear of hyperkalemia or actual hyperkalemia. So now we have uh, something in our toolkit to try to combat that. Pyle, any other comments you'd like to make about Diamond? You know, I think Diamond is in fact so simple that it's brilliant. And I, I wonder why we didn't think of this before because it takes me back to my days of residency when we used to always give Kaxalate to everyone with their hyperkalemia when they came in with acute renal failure. So I think the fact that it allowed 85% of patients who had previously either had hyperkalemia or were at risk for hyperkalemia to stay on their RAS inhibitors, it's, it's really something that I may start using in my practice. I totally agree with you. The last trial we want to talk about today is the IVVE trial. Pyle, give us a, your thoughts about that study. So I'm not sure about the name here. So the acronym here, I'm not sure if it really has a cool meaning or not, but it is a very important study. And I think it makes a really good point, particularly given that we just went through this pandemic. So this is a study of the flu vaccine. And we all know that flu is, is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular death and adverse outcomes. And yet for some reason, many of our ASCVD patients don't end up getting the flu shot. So this was a study to look and see whether a randomized control trial of the flu vaccine in patients with heart failure across the spectrum of EF, so those with half ref and half pef um, could improve their outcomes in Asian countries if they were randomized to the flu shot. Uh, so they were. Uh, this was done over three seasons. So it was a year after year study. And I was interested to see that about 30% of patients in the trial actually had an ejection fraction less than 30%. So our you know, significant half ref patients. And unfortunately, what they found was that there was no significant difference in the MACE outcomes in the overall cohort. But if you broke it down according to when the peak flu season happened, you did see that there was a significant decrease uh, in, in pneumonia, in hospitalizations, as well as MACE outcomes occurring in these patients with heart failure. So to me, the takeaway remains the same, which is that the flu shot saves lives and keeps people out of the hospital. For heart failure patients, staying out of the hospital, regardless of what the reason for hospitalization is, is one of the most important goals. And that really, you know, shines a spotlight on that based on this study. So I think I just need to do a better job of making sure that my patients who come into the clinic, whether they have ASCVD or heart failure, are getting their annual flu vaccine, because we do know that the uptake of that vaccine has continued to decrease over time. Yes, yeah, certainly we can argue in this population, reducing hospitalization for pneumonia is an important endpoint. Uh, and giving the shots prior to the season when they're likely to get the flu makes all kinds of sense. Any other comments from you, Deepak, on this particular study? I think it's a terrific study. I think it lends further support to influenza vaccination, certainly in the peak season. While heart failure events per se weren't reduced, pneumonia was significantly reduced, cut in about half. So that should be good enough to convince people, you know, get the flu shot if they were already on the fence, which hopefully they won't be. But I mean, we've seen lots of vaccine hesitancy, obviously in the context of COVID, lots of preventable deaths, unfortunately. Uh, no reason that that should also happen with influenza. I mean, influenza vaccine in some shape or form has been around for a while, uh, very safe. And every year, you know, there are tens of thousands of hospitalizations and deaths and adverse events occurring because of influenza. Uh, hopefully now people, because of the COVID pandemic, will realize we need to do more about influenza as well. And, you know, prior work from the MI trial, for example, had shown in patients uh, largely with MI that, that influenza vaccine was useful, uh, even in terms of having lower all-cause mortality. So at this point, I think the jury is totally in. I get your patients the influenza shot. Agree completely. There you have it. Day two highlights. We've talked about Pac-Man, Diamond, et cetera. Great trials and important science that we're bringing to you from acc.org. For Pyle and Deepak, this is Kim Eagle for acc.org, and we're out.